Booyaka shout, welcome back to another episode of Can't Handle Heat, it's your boy G Swizz, joined by local Joe, Jokesy, how we doing broski? I am absolutely fired up, just got back in town, long travel day, so you know, it's a rough season for the Lunaburg boys over here too, but... The Burger Boys? <laughs> yeah, the Burger Boys, it's been rough, been rough, Eliminated but from the you know, Seb back Cup? in town, yeah, definitely play Freedy Soft on Saturday night, so, big one, you guys can watch Bounce House TV. No free promo, so we can't say their name. But, yeah, check it out. You can come watch us. No free promos. Hey, really quick, this is something I learned about the Bulgarian League. Joe, do you guys bet on your games? Like, do you ever bet on your games at all? You are not allowed to do that. So, in Bulgaria, you are allowed to do that. You're allowed no, to you're bet. Not. Dude, not yes, you are. Not through the FIVB. Not through the FIVB, bro. You're right. not allowed to. It's I not. I want to point something out. I have never bet on my games. This is something I've learned throughout the players in the league. I want to make that very, very clear. I'm being very translucent. Apparently, that's what they say. They say that you can bet on your games as long as you only bet that you're going to win, not if you're going to lose. But I've, there's underground stories of obviously people betting on that. That is not legal at all. It's definitely not legal. You can get in a lot of trouble for this. Should this be included in the podcast? Go watch, go watch Bad Sport. <laughs> Everybody go watch Bad Sport. And see why it's not legal. Well, uh, like I said, I haven't done any of this. My team hasn't done any of this. Penalize the other teams if they have. That was, that was wow. Okay. Well, that was not what I was expecting. <laughs> um, also, this is not a solo dolo podcast. We're going to be having Matt Anderson hopping on the podcast, talking about from the start, end of his career, mental health, and everything in between. And also, another guest, Mike Amaha. He'll be hopping on as well. He has a big game. Special guest. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. He, he has a big game, so he's traveling right now, and he'll hop on with Matt when Matt hops on. So this is why he's not joining us currently. Um, and we do, the reason we don't po- post Mike's games is because it is, although Poland is an extremely respectable league and is very well covered in Poland, if you're outside of Poland, very hard to watch. If you're not <laughs> going through back websites or willing to pay – Certain euros a month, or I don't know their currency. Um, but yeah, so that's why, unfortunately, we don't post uh, Micah's games as much. It's going to get MVPs and, and highlights. But again, I want to give a quick shout out to our sponsor, Manscaped. This holiday season, I'm giving thanks to our friends at Manscaped. Do I tell my extended family that I have the Performance Package 4.0 from the global leaders in below waist grooming? Not to mention, it includes the Lawnmower 4.0. Trimmer to tame my bush and score brownie points with the in-laws. Gift yourself Manscaped or the man in your life who needs it. Join the 4 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with 20% off and free shipping with the code. What's the code, Joe? Give it to him, baby. Volleyballs. All capital. And plural. It'll appear right now. Promo code appear right now. Use the code volleyballs by going to manscaped.com. Type it in that bad boy. 20% off, free worldwide shipping. Without further ado, the wonderful, the masterful, Matt Anderson. We're now joined here by three-time Olympian, long-standing USA team member, Matt Anderson. Matt, thanks so much for hopping on the pod, my man. Yeah, no worries. No worries, man. It, so, so... Yeah. Wh- Oh, sorry about that. So I was just curious, where are you joining us right now, uh, out of curiosity? Yeah, I am currently in Perugia, which is in uh, the Umbria region of Italy. I'm here with my pro team. My family's here with me. I am sitting in the office of our house. That's awesome. That's pretty next level for anyone joining, to have an office in your house given to you by your club. Yeah, we when we first got here, we, we had a pretty sick apartment. Really nice, they just redid it. But it was in the, the center or near the center of Perugia. In Perugia, the cities in Umbria are much different from other cities in uh, different regions in Italy where there's it's really hard to get to the center of the city here because it's up on top of a hill. And uh, Oh, interesting. So yeah, so it was it was a cool setup if I didn't have a little kid, but we have a toddler that needs to go outside and, and do stuff. So that's so really, interesting. And a lot yeah, of the we a little bit, found, found a pretty cool house that has 
a big open area where he can play outside and, and we're, we're relatively that's close to some parks so that's, that's that. so nice and you so you're saying that a lot of the cities in that region the centers are on top of a hill yeah um from from my understanding um like so Perugia is a pretty big city, like, but we're, we're really close to like Assisi, uh, which is another really big, uh, famous city here in Umbria. And it's, it's, they're all up on, like, just driving down the autostrada, you're going to see all these little hills and there's always a city right on top of it. Oh, that's crazy. So it's a way to, I mean, in my understanding, it's a way of like back in the day, keeping invaders out, you know? Yeah, for sure. Protection based. Yeah. So. So as you kind of continue as a career, obviously, as you get older, you have a family. And then as you get more prominent, you're, you can make more demands when it comes to with the club. So when you as, as you got older, what are some more things you're like, OK, I realize that I have some leverage here with my skill level going up mm-hmm. and my value going up. It's like maybe like a, like, OK, I want a house like like that or like at this point or, or as you kind of got older, what did you kind of uh, I mean that you're allowed to publicly share. What do you kind of like prioritize and ask for when it came to the club searching? Yeah, for sure. Um, well, creature comforts, like you said. So now with the family, we, we need more than a one bedroom apartment, you know? Yeah. So um, we usually, I always had at least two. Uh, my first year in Italy, I only had a one bedroom because um, I was in the south of Italy and I really had no idea what to ask for at that point in time. Um, but two bedrooms that is now progressed to at least three bedrooms because one for us, me and my wife, one for our son. And then if we ever have visitors, we want them to be able to stay with us and not have to go to a hotel. Um, now we get two cars, um, one for me to go to and from training and one for my family so that they can do stuff, not be stuck in a house. Um, I early on did business class flights uh, for for me, and then anytime um, as I got married, as we had a kid, um, just adding one more of those onto the the contract. Um, but yeah, there. I mean, I'm sponsored by Nike, so I have to put into my contract uh, my shoes. Excuse me, um, so that I can wear them on the court because a lot of teams, even I mean, the bigger clubs have sponsors, and their sponsors, if a prominent player is not wearing the shoes, they want to know why. Um, Mm -hmm. And to basically get rid of all of that confusion or issues, I put it in my contracts and basically says, like, it's not just solely my shoes, but it's if, if I carry an individual endorsement deal with some company it doesn't conflict with the clubs and that's just the way it is. That's, that's so, that's so amazing. I mean, as a, cause, cause there's I, levels to this. Yeah. Cause, I, cause levels to this. I, like I said, this is my first year. So the, the route to get here was just chaoticness. So I could only imagine like, so, so do they cover, like, let's say your wife wants to go back and your kid wants to go back. Do they cover the flights there and back as well? Not, uh, I mean, not during the season. Oh, okay. Um, so basically, I'll get one round trip ticket for each of us that the team will cover. Okay. Um, and then, like my like my wife is going to go home for Christmas and the holidays with my son and, and stuff to be with family because when we play on the 26th, we play on the 29th, we play on the second of January. Right. Like we're we're pretty crushed. Um, so I mean, even if they were here, we want to give much time to celebrate the holidays and turn all together. So they're going to go back home, and, and this ticket will cover. But um, it's not a good or there with that. But um, the, I guess I missed like the, the biggest one is uh, with the national team. Uh, Micah, you know this. Uh, sometimes our, our tournaments, like World Cup, can go into the end of August, early September. Sometimes even into October, depending on the year of the quad and, and whatnot. Um, but I always put that I get a week off after the national team in a week after the the pro season with Team USA. Um, Just so I can figure out, you know, (laughs) what I'm doing Uh, now, especially traveling with the family. It's not as easy as just, okay, I'm gonna pack a suitcase and go. Like, I'm I'm good to go. I have have other things to worry about. And part of that is making sure my family is safe and, and comfortable before I go back on the road. 
Yeah, those transition periods can get so gnarly. And yeah. having a family, I can't even imagine. So, There's been so many times where I've just left like things. <laughs> and I was like, I already have four bags. Like, I just I don't <clears throat> have the possibility to carry anymore. And I got to leave in less than four hours to the airport, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, now I take a little bit more of a relaxed approach to it and, and make sure that I have everything that I need. And, we, well, I should say we have everything we need and we get to where we need to be and we're comfortable before we move on. And, and you know, I know we wanted to get into a little bit about like your transition over like your career to different clubs. I, would, I just want to ask like, cause it's the most kind of recent one um, in terms of like leaving Kazan was a lot of that because of like the family and you just had a kid and you wanted to be in a place that was a little more I don't know, easier for families to get into and live because I know we were talking to Micah like two weeks ago and he's struggling a lot just being able to get his family into the country. Yeah, shoot, I've been talking to Micah too about it, and I and um, yes, part of, I mean part of my journey as I mean just as an individual has been compartmentalizing what it means to be an athlete, what it means to be a person on top of that, um, and the way I said that it was probably incorrect like you're a person first and then you're an athlete on top of that and then adding a personal relationship into it adding a family um like Micah said there there's a lot of levels to the to people and individuals in general and I knew that we would we didn't have a, a child yet and we didn't we actually didn't even know we were going to get pregnant before we moved to Modena from Kazan but I had been in Kazan for seven years. We had a pretty gnarly run on both the domestic championships. We won four Champions Leagues in a row. Uh, it was pretty much at that point in time, my career had run its course in, in Kazan. And I was looking to potentially move to a club where I could play opposite because with the national team, that's what I play. And I wanted to basically stop the left playing on the left professional national team on the right and just because the way my mind works it, it caused a lot of anxiety and a lot of stress that was something that hopefully i could mitigate by just going playing opposite um ended up not playing opposite but uh moved to to motor now because we got a pretty good contract and they were willing to work with me on some things and um of course, Italy is a much easier country to get to as an American. So we could have our family come and visit us more and, and, and make it, although we weren't back in America, make it a little bit more accessible to our family in, in both ways. So what was the what was the hardest thing for, for getting in the mindset of switching positions? What was the biggest thing that was like the biggest daunting task? And which do you prefer as well? Um... Well, the hardest part is passing. I mean, so coming back to the professional league and passing against the best servers in the world, um, and after not doing it for a while, it's it's very hard. But um, switching to the right, so basically going to opposite for the national team, the hardest part is you hit the ground, and after ten days, you have your first competition. So. Even though I play um, OH1, so I'm close to the center and, and row one, I'm, I'm spiking on the right. I get some action over there, but I mean, all the blocking schemes, all the defense in one versus six, like, I mean, it's completely different. And I'm a, the hardest part for me is I'm giving myself the leeway to make mistakes. I don't like doing that. Um, I'm a perfectionist through and through. And I mean, there's even now going back to the left, like my team is very understanding in the fact that I haven't played on the left in two years and I haven't passed in consistently in, in big matches in over two years. So, um, but I don't give myself that, that leeway, like I said. And so I've had sleepless nights with anxiety about it because I mean, I want to, I know I can do it. I know I can perform at the level that they need me to and the level that I hold myself to. But sometimes it just doesn't work, and that's sport. So. You know, we we have to ask because we you kind of you kind of touched on it really f quickly. 
But what do you feel? Everybody we talk to has a different opinion, obviously. But what do you feel is the most difficult position in volleyball to play? Middle blocker. Mm. Middle blocker. Okay. Is that uh-huh. is that like just physically or is mentally as well? I think there's so much that goes into being a middle blocker. Um, like part of so understanding systems and like understanding our system versus another team like they have to understand where they need to be at all times and all like they're removing constantly like following the setter like the left attacker hits on the left pin the right attacker hits on the right pin middle blockers are flying all over the place they have to block everything that the other team is doing and this like a split set uh, split set split second transition to now being offensive and then immediately back to defensive they're getting crushed and then they go sit out for three rotations and then have to come back in and they have to go sit out and then come back in it's, That's true. It's, yes so, so, you, go ahead. so you say that like sitting out three rotations is act i can actually see that that sitting out the rotations makes it more difficult because some people will be like oh they're only in half the game so there's no way that it can be the most difficult yeah, position, but I, you're you're saying that the three rotations being out is, makes it difficult. In my experience, talking to middle blockers, yes. Um, okay. Talking to some of the best middle blockers in the world, yes. Because I mean, shoot, they can miss a serve and then they have to sit out for three rotations, thinking about that they just <laughs> made an error. And oh, it could snap. be it could be as simple as you know six serves and they're back in the game. Or it could be they could be out for half, I don't know, 20 minutes, depending on if somebody <laughs> goes on a run or whatever. We get stuck in a rotation. They get stuck in a rotation. Staying warm, and then they hit the court, and it's go time, man. They are. Yeah, it is warm. pretty gnarly. To, that is very true. It is very gnarly to just like this hot and cold, hot and cold. And like, yeah. and they got to be so quick and dynamic when they are in that sure. even physically, it's probably crazy demanding. I'm mm-hmm. not sure how they don't get more injured because they're also like so big. So it's not like these little like guys that are like, they're like big dudes. Like if you're getting cold on the side and you're seven feet, like it's going to take a while to warm back up and do these things that you're supposed to be doing when you're back on the court. For sure. For sure. Is there a position that you could say is like the easiest or that you would think might could be the easiest? <laughs> Yeah, I can hear a lot of feelings right now. Um, <laughs> uh, definitely, I think opposites are the easiest. Um, but they also are, there's a lot that they're like demanded of. So like an opposite is a cleanup guy in a lot of ways. And they serve, they have to serve hard. They have to kill, terminate balls and high ball situations. And, they have to block balls. They have to, you know, the easiest thing that an opposite has to do is get one dig per set, you know, because <laughs> nobody's expecting it out of you. Uh, but um, yeah, I would say opposite ceases. And that, that's not why I, I, I didn't answer your question before about which I like better. Um, I think I like opposite better because. I just have more experience playing with the national team as an opposite. And my biggest goal is trying to win an Olympic gold medal. And therefore, although it's the hardest struggling and um, it's the hardest speed to get to, um, I find the most joy and the most reward out of going after that one. So that's why I like it the best. We touched on your previous stint in Kazan, um, and I think also a way, a good thing to do is to go through like the path that these players are taking, because a lot of people don't know um, like where people are going, what like a journey looks like for a person that's been in the game for as long as you, and so maybe we can go through a little bit of where you started, mm-hmm. Korea, am I correct? Yeah, South Korea. Yeah, okay, so you started in South Korea and you graduated early from Penn State. I left early. I oh, you left know. early. You well, left early. And we can talk about that decision yeah. as well into Korea and then kind of like your path along the professional journey. Yeah. Um, well, so coming off my junior year uh, uh, at, at Penn State, we had just won the national championship. And I remember 
in the springtime, I went out to Long Beach to play in the active ankle tournament. I spoke with Ron Larson, who at the time I had no no offense to Uncle, uh, Uncle Ron Larson. There. Uh, Uncle Ron. I had no idea who he was. Um, he just came up to me and said that he was the assistant coach of the national team and he really liked what I did. And don't be surprised if I get a phone call to go out that summer. I was like, okay, cool. Right. And, and sorry, I should touch back, like my progression through USA Volleyball, through college, everything. I honestly had no idea what I was going to do. I just got a phone call that, hey, this, this college is interested in you. Do you want to go on a visit? Sure. Hey, you got selected to the ATU, um, like developmental high performance team. Do you want to come out for a camp? Sure. Like I just, doors open and I just kind of said yes and just kept going. Eventually got to this point at Penn State and, um, for the national championship, it was in Irvine, and luckily the national team trains right, right there in Anaheim at the time, and we're still out there. And so Hugh McCutcheon was the head coach, and I think it was two days after the national championship, I was back at Penn State, and I, uh, I'm not, not afraid to say I was partying quite a bit and celebrating our win and, and having a good time. And I was also looking forward to because it, it was the first summer I was going to have off. So I was looking forward to just being a college kid and, and enjoying my apartment at in State College and working camps that summer and all that jazz and everything. Like yeah, that. yeah, yeah. What do that I thought was so much fun. Um, and Hugh called me and was basically saying, "Hey, we want to invite you out to California to start the national team." And I was like, "Okay." Um, like any. He shut down my aspirations pretty quickly that I wasn't coming out the train to go to the Olympics because that was 2008, the Beijing Games. It's like, but we want you to come out and train with the uh, Pan Am team, and there's a a chance we could send you to Japan for a week training block with the Japanese national team. So I said, okay, when when you need me out there, and he's like, whenever you can come, let us know, and we'll get you a ticket. So I, I think I was at Penn State for I know a few days. I went up to my hometown in Buffalo, New York to be with my family for a couple of days and flew out to California to train. I went to Japan shoot, uh, a week later. It was like just seven guys. Um, a couple of guys Jeez, that played like... Guys. Yeah, it was just like a training block. Um, Dang. It was, it was me, Evan Paddock, Paul Lotman, John Winder, uh, I think Nate Meerstein. Shoot, I don't know who else, honestly. That's crazy. Sorry, stuff, sorry guys, guys. I forget about you. Uh, but basically, they just wanted some guys to just come and bang sirs and yeah. high balls and stuff, just to help them train to qualify for their last minute qualifier for the Olympics, which they ended up doing. Uh, but there were some pro scouts there that um, saw me in. I, I remember sitting in my hotel room, Matt Pro was there too, um, and getting an email the last day that we were there right before it went out, and I thought it was a joke. I thought like the guys had set something up and like got some Japanese agent to write me and <laughs> make a joke. And, but at the same time, like I was a NCAA athlete, I had no idea like corresponding with an agent, like you can't do that, right? Yeah, like, right, right, right all these things that were going through my head and I couldn't tell if it was real or not. And so there was a way around it. And basically somebody acted for me and corresponded for me to find out its validity. And it was real. Um, by the time it, too much time had passed and they found somebody else for that job in, in Japan, but that agent was able to find a, a a relatively similar contract in Korea. Um, and so then that process started of me talking to my family, talking to my college coach and understanding like, can I go play pro right now? Like what's stopping me? What, uh, what benefits happen if I stay in school and finish my degree versus what happens if I just go and play pro? And obviously, Everyone knows my decision. I went and played pro and, and it was very simple, black and white. I just made it pros and cons and the pros outweighed 
the cons of going to play professionally. And um, so I decided to go play. And that was Korea. That's, then, it's crazy because these like small things always are what lead to like such yeah. big tra- changes in your life. It's just like, oh, like it, life is so fragile. You say yes to one thing and then you're in the right place at, a, at the right time and then something else pops up. And like 10 years later, you're like a science teacher at some school and you're like, how did I get here? It's like that one thing yeah. led Man, to like, this whole new road. Going to Penn State, I was fully ready to get a degree and go back to Western New York and be a PE teacher if I could be and just that's crazy be around with my family and quickly after like getting to Penn State and understanding like what could be like just talking to some older guys that were you know in their fifth year and they were trying to go play professionally and what that looked like and I was dude, you can do this? They're like, oh yeah, we're going to go to Puerto Rico and make 25 grand in a few months. And I was like, wait, I, can I do yeah, that? Sign like, me that's up. incredible. <laughs> like go live on the beach. And, and they're like, oh yeah, but then we go play in Europe. Because at that time, the Puerto Rican league was in the, in the summertime. So it was the three months in the summertime. If they weren't on the national team, they went and played in Puerto Rico. And then they would go play overseas. Well, that's a good they deal. Would, yeah, it, it was a pretty cool setup. But then, and then Port, the Puerto Rican League tried to um, compete with some European leagues and stuff like that. But, anyways, I was like, wow, screw being a teacher. Like, I'll go play pre- professional volleyball if I can. Like, this is amazing. But, uh, yeah, I ended up in Korea for my first couple of years. So, was it like, a, I'm sure it wasn't like seamless, but was there like a big thing where you were like, maybe I shouldn't have left early. Was there ever like doubt in your mind? And what was like the biggest like culture shock when you got there? Um, yeah, I definitely had doubts. I just, I knew I was going to miss my friends. Uh-huh. I mean, some, some guys at Penn State, I mean, Max Holt was my college roommate, my freshman roommate. So like, luckily he continued to play and like, I've always had him around. And we've known each other for going on 18 years now. Like it's pretty wild. And we've been playing volleyball together for that long. But like some other guys, I just talked to them and they're dudes that I check in with more so than sometimes my friends back home that I grew up with. So um, I knew I was going to miss them. I knew that, you know, we had a really good team coming back too. And like, there was a chance that we could repeat and, and what that looked like. And did I need to do that to prove that I was a good enough player in college and then my thoughts started to kind of evolve. My goals started to evolve because I don't mean to downplay the NCAA, but my goals moved on pretty quickly. Like my junior year, I played really well and I had won all the individual accolades you can win pretty much in college. Um, I won best player, player of the year for my conference, which is the EIBA. I won MVP of the EIBA tournament. I won co-player of the year with Paul Lottman, which whatever, say what it is. <laughs> not um, mad about it. Yeah, Paul's one of the best. <laughs> I'm not mad about it. Um, but then I won MVP of the NCAA tournament. We won the NCAA. It's like, what else did I need, you know? And if somebody wanted to say that, I was an okay player in college. Well, honestly, I just didn't care anymore because my goals would have moved to the professional ranks. And then the, ch- the chance to play in the Olympics, like that was my goal now. Um, so it's like the small fries didn't bother me anymore. Um, but the hardest thing is just transitioning and like learning what it means to be a professional. Like what is professionalism? Like everybody has a different idea and you know different countries different teams within those countries and within those systems those leagues they have different ideas and you know a very quick lesson i learned was professional sports is not like college sports without schoolwork like there's so much more that goes into it and the only person stopping you from being a professional from succeeding is yourself like yeah, you can get a, a 
quote unquote crappy coach or you can be put on a bad team or, or whatnot, you know, have some individual politics influence your season. But it, I mean, talent and hard work shines through and the only person stopping you is yourself. And I learned that pretty quickly. Um, real quick story my first year in korea we're in first place by like three or four matches we're, we're kind of cruising through the season we're playing really well and we're playing the number two team which at the time was samsung we were the hyundai capital skywalkers so what's up That's um, <laughs> so we're playing the samsung blue fangs at the time and i think we we lost in five it was like a, it was a crazy battle we played them at their place and I think it was all due sets. The fifth set was like 18, 16, we lost. It was just, we're all crushed. We get back in the locker room and our coach just lays into us. We didn't get dinner, okay? So mind you, we're adults, professional athletes. We didn't get dinner. Got on the team bus, no showers, back to the gym, our like home kind of complex. We lived on like campus. Even guys that were married with kids and everything, like we all lived in like basically a dorm situation. Got back to the the campus and again right to our rooms everyone showered knock on the door like two hours later like hey we got training train for three hours in the middle of the night got some food then went to sleep what? woke up at like 6 30 in the morning seven in the morning something like that another three hour training it was like it's like wow where am i what is going oh my on god yeah, it was gnarly. But that is not, and it's gnarly. It's gnarly to think about that in college, and then it's even gnarlier to think that you're by yourself, like 22, in South Korea. You don't even know what's going on. Do you yeah. have a translator? Yeah. Yeah, I you have a that. translator, and then you're just like, "What am I doing? What are we even like? What is going on?" I heard the yeah. translators live with the athlete, or nowadays. I don't. Was that was that the same then? Yeah. So I was lucky. The guy that was my translator was actually an old player of the team he was just a few years older than i was um and he unfortunately had a really bad knee injury so he couldn't play anymore like he tore up his knee and had some surgeries and so i had to fix it but was no longer able to play but so he knew he knew english really well and also knew all the translations into like volleyball terminology so it's not like they're just getting a a random translator that speaks really good English and really good Korean. Like this guy knew the ins and outs of the game, knew the ins and outs of like the team dynamics and how everything worked. And he was also a really good friend with the guys because he played for this club. So um, like I said, I was really lucky, but yeah, he lived right there on the campus with us. That's awesome. So, so then, so you playing for Korea uh, for how long? For the, those first two seasons the okay. second season in january the end of january my, my father passed away um so i actually went home for a couple of weeks to be there for the funeral and everything like that came back for two almost three weeks um and the team actually was like you know what just go home be with your family they paid out my contract and i got to go home so i was home in february end of february or something like that early march um, and then and then you moved on. did you did you I, did you go to Italy? you went to Kazan right after you the, no, the next club you no. were was Kazan right no I went to Vibo Valencia which is in the south of Italy okay. um TJ DeFalco just played there last year um a couple other Americans have played there Ben Cash played there um yeah so I went there we did okay I think we finished like I think we finished ninth which was like Absolutely perfect because I think there were 16 teams in the league. One through eight went to the playoffs. Nine and 10 were out. And 11 through 16 had a play out to go down. So, oh, that's brutal. And, and it was like, it was what the team was shooting for because they wanted to stay in A1. Um, obviously, they would have wished to go to the playoffs, but I mean, at that time, the Italian league was like super, super strong. And we made it to the Italian cup. So we finished in top eight, top four, top eight, I think, okay. sorry, top eight, the, the first half of the season. 
So they were like super stoked on that. And then we ended up winning our last match against Verona, but there was like other matches that happened that like if this team won, we, we couldn't get enough points or anything like that. So we ended the season on a win, got to go home the next day. It was incredible. We uh uh you I think I think you actually played with my coach my current coach there, uh we call him Vensi I, I I had to look up his full name uh Venceslav Simeonov I definitely butchered that yeah, but yeah he, uh, yeah he was my my uh, he was the opposite tell him I said what's up for sure was he uh, really quick I just want to what kind of player was he because sometimes he's very like this but sometimes he's very very calm was he like a very bravado kind of player or was he a very chill player because on the sideline sometimes. Like my favorite thing he says to me, he's like, like if I mess up, he's like, why, Gage, why? And I'm like, I, I, I didn't mean to, sorry, coach, or something like that. So, but but I love him to death. You gotta stand up for yourself, dude. Uh, no, he um, he was a pretty solid dude and just kind of a hard worker. Put your head down. And I mean, he, he had a really good relationship with our setter. Our setter's best set was back. Mm-hmm. He ran a really fast ball, and I mean, obviously he was part of the reason why we did so well. Um, he, but he, he didn't, to my recollection, wasn't necessarily like an up and down player, like emotionally, but he was, he was a good teammate. Yeah. That's all. That's what you asked for. Um, yeah. so then you moved and then you moved on Kazan after that. Yeah. No, then I moved to Modena. So I had a two year contract there. Modena bought out my contracts and I went up to Modena for one year. Uh, really kind of a disastrous season. Um, some political things happened in, in the background and everything. It just didn't set the season up for a good tone. Um, and we ended up losing the quarterfinals, I think, of the playoffs. Or sorry, that year they had like a final tournament or something like that. It was a weird season. Something happened and... Um, they actually wanted us all to stay and train for like four more weeks, even though we weren't competing anymore. Uh, but luckily, I played on the national team. We were going to the Olympics, so I got out of that pretty quickly um, and went home uh, and trained. But that summer, um, during World League, which is now called BNL, um, my agent came to me with a, a contract to go to either Dino Moscow or Kazan. And uh, I knew Kazan because Lloyd Ball and Clay Stanley played there. And I was like, those Americans play there. Like I'll go there versus another team that I don't really know anything about. And <laughs> so they bought out my contract. Yeah, it was there. I signed a, a two plus one, which is basically after the second season, you decide if you want to stay, they decided if you want to stay, figure it out and I ended up staying for seven years. Which is ridiculous. I, like, I think people are starting to get, at least our listeners on the podcast are starting to understand the, the pro side of um, volleyball because for most Americans, even us, like we don't know a lot about mm-hmm. the pro side of volleyball. Uh, but seven years somewhere mm-hmm. is a yeah, ridiculous that's... amount of time. Yeah, and I mean, honestly, <laughs> I remember talking to the one of the managers of the team and He's one of the guys that speaks English that would like help us with like our getting our visas and everything like that. Um, and he was t- we were on a flight, so at this time Kazan had quite a bit of money, and we were chartering everywhere. And we we're on a flight back from Noah Sabir's, and we just we weren't having the best season. I mean, we're still in first place, but we weren't just like playing our best, you know. He's like, you know what, Matt? I think this is my fourth season. It's like I think. I think you're done. I think you just, you got to stop coming back here. Like I want, I want a different foreigner to come. He's like nothing against you. Like I'm having a great time with you, but you know, we just need somebody new and maybe I can get somebody from like Brazil or something. I was like, I don't know, man, talk to, talk to a like, no, and, you know, like we we're just laughing it off. Cause there's a guy like I used to grab beers with and stuff like that. After yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, I ended up staying for a few more years and, they retired my jersey and everything like that, and it's it's been a pretty wild ride. And I I miss those guys. I miss a lot of the the players that I first played with there. That I, I again I still stay in touch with them. Send them messages on WhatsApp here and there. And but like, it's it's sporadic throughout the year, but still care about those guys and, and everything because it was I mean 
Seven years is a big chunk of your life. That is. That's like almost double college. <laughs> yeah. For you, it's more than double college, but... <laughs> <laughs> So how long did it take you to speak? I mean, I'm assuming you speak Russian, yeah? No, I don't speak Russian. Whoa! <laughs> how did you? How did you I knew enough. I knew enough to get around. I knew like how to order stuff off menus. Uh, when my then girlfriend, now wife, came my last season there, um, I <laughs> ended up speaking much better Russian because I was caring for her like she i wasn't expecting her to know anything so like going to restaurants or going just about town like being able to converse if she had a question instead of me just being like i don't know like, right <laughs> like i'll just figure it out myself like i'll google translate on my phone or something but it's, she's got like more of a specific question and i would i would basic conversational russian i knew but i've since then forgot a lot of it that's Matt, crazy. it's like a couple things and we're going to let you go here. I, I just wanted to touch upon, uh, well, there's two kind of. One, have you seen the thing on um, Amanda Knox? Mm-hmm. I never hear about anything from Perugia until I saw this document. I'm like, this is yeah. it's right in Perugia. So yeah. that that's kind of a wild story in itself. Um, and it's catching a lot in the U.S. news and there's a Netflix series. But yeah. I don't know if that was talked about in your town. Um, I actually, you know what? I haven't talked to anybody on my team. My wife actually asked me to talk to some some people uh, about it. Just curiosity, you know, figuring out like mm-hmm. if, if it's still like, do they think she did it still? Like, what's Wait, what on? is this? Well, I have no idea. Yeah, I have no idea what's going on. I've right never now. heard about this. <laughs> you can explain it. Or you want me to? The you you can go for it. I was I was so, listening to a podcast. It was uh, an American student that came to Perugia because so Perugia has a a foreigner a university for foreigners that's like world renowned so like okay. a lot of very wealthy people send their children here if they're wanting to go uh, okay, overseas okay. for whatever for a university but so she was an American I think she's from the Pacific Northwest right you see, I'll, I'll, or yeah. Portland Portland so, or Seattle I think something like that and so she came here to go to school and her roommate um, was murdered and they pinned it on her and her boyfriend yeah i think it's basically like said like she was part of like this yeah. whole sexual scandal kind of thing and basically like the police had it out for her they just were looking for like they had to solve the case really quickly and they pointed yeah. it her. So anyways, when they like, she got convicted and um, then went through the process of appeal and the truth came out, she didn't do it. I don't know, actually, I have no idea, but from my yeah. understanding, in fact, she didn't do it. And uh, so it was just this huge thing, but it happened here in Peru. That's why. And that's recently? Uh, or this is coming this story is beginning the Netflix now. the Netflix yeah. film came out recently oh okay, 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 okay. It, it happened what oh, yeah, 20 years ago yeah somebody, so, yeah. okay okay, okay it, was a, it was significant it was recent. time ago yeah when it, it happened it was it was world news man it was it was wild it, oh, I, I remember it when it happened um like just seeing news articles and stories Joe, you had yeah. another thing because I got two things I want to touch it on. It has too. nothing to do with my last question. I just recall it because I was listening to another podcast with that today and I'm like, Bruges, and we were having Matt on. So um, the other thing is just Alecno because I, um, here in the German league, I'm playing here in the Bundesliga. This is my third season. And when we were, when I was with Friedrichshof in the past couple of years, we'd a lot of the times go out with the Berlin guys after. And I got a chance to talk to Gronk in a decent amount mm-hmm. of times just about his experiences and his experiences with Alecno. And he has some like, and his is obviously all with the national team and his experiences there and just how brutal the Russian media is he would talk about. Um, but I just wanted to get your just perspective on Alekno and what makes him such a successful coach. I think, like, obviously anywhere he's at, he's able to be successful and um, just kind of, like, the, the details of why you felt like he – or wasn't maybe at times a good fit for you guys at Kazan. Um, yeah, okay, so – I think Alekno, 
he's not going to make you a technically better player. But what he did for me was made me incredibly mentally strong. Like it's, it's a very, I don't, I don't know if it was something that I just developed because of the way he coached or if it's a, a tactic of his as a coach it was very simple was just win. Like it's not hard, you know, like, yes, it is really hard, but you have, we had everything in place in Kazan to succeed and win. And the only thing we had to do was just do that, just win. So um, he prepared us well for our opponents. Um, but I think most professional teams do that. You know, you watch video, you, you break down film and break down the team by statistics if you want or, or whatnot. And, um, so basically going into matches, you have all the information is there and every team has that information. What separates you from another team winning is your ability to have the trust that you're going to win. And I think a lot of the matches that we won, we won before we even walked in the gym, you know, like a yeah. team knowing that they're playing against us, you know, Oh shoot! They got Leon. They have Mikhail. They have Anderson. They have Wolvich. They have Budko. It's like, yeah, you know. And I personally would walk into gyms and be like, oh shoot! They got Simone. They got Bruno. They got Leal. They got Montarena. But I never said like, oh shoot! They got them in a way of like they're gonna. Oh, we really have to play well to beat them. It's like, okay, I know what they're gonna do. You know. Um, where we just, we had a bravado about us and a lot of that came from a uh, so like he just put me in a place that I remember a conversation we had where he was like, I first sat down with him when I got to his for the first year, he asked me what I've been doing for the last month. Cause I had a month off because Russian visas are always a hassle. Um, and I said, pretty much nothing. I've been working out a couple of times here there. He's like, do you work out with volleyball at all? I was like, nope. He goes, okay, well, we play in the Super Cup in two days. You're playing, so get ready. And I was like, okay, cool. Like, I'm going to try. He's like, no, you're 25 years old. There's no trying anymore. You're a man. Go out there and play. And I was like, okay. Like, <laughs> set the tone pretty quick about, like, what we were doing and what it meant to be on this team and, the team came from a long history of winning. It just came off Champions League. He just came off winning a gold medal in the Olympics. Like there was, he said it in a way that was so calm and direct, but also in a way that like I couldn't refute it. Like there was no like, well, you know, I haven't passed in a month, and you know, my last experience wasn't so good. We lost in the Olympics. Like there was no excuses. Just go out there and win. And it was a hard first year. It's like, I mean, we had Yuri Bereshko on the bench behind me, who was an Olympic champion. Again, just came off the line games, but is arguably one of the best passing outsides in the world, hands down. And then there's me. And I was like, oh, well, sh shoot, I got to beat this guy out? Like, so it was constant back and forth. But it, it was a great first season. And again, I met a lot of guys on that team that – that first year that I, our good friends how'd that game go by the way <laughs> we lost the first two sets came back in one and five hey how'd you play? that was the that was the, the two played, sets of practice you needed yeah i played pretty darn well i played pretty darn well and then we went out the party yeah it was a good time that's right to hear Mike, I, have, I know you had some stuff yeah i had just have two um so i have the privilege of playing with matt a couple for a couple years i had and, the privilege of playing with you and uh there's nobody more professional than Matt, like not even close. And Matt, you touched on that you learned what being a professional is. What, when did you learn it? How did you learn it? How do you keep this, um, like how do you do it day in and day out? Mm -hmm. um, I know that there's no secret to success. It's hard work and like you said, hard, hard work and talent. Um, 
everyone knows what it takes to be successful and it's there, like the recipe is there and a bunch of people can't do it. Mm -hmm. uh, you've been able to do it and I've been able to watch it and it's something that's crazy special. You can even, if you can even like explain what a day that the routine well yeah what your routine is on a national team practice day because you're there first you, you're lifting before anyone else and then you're there pretty much last um so the professionalism of matt anderson is kind of what i wanted to capture in a question i don't know exactly how to frame it to be able to get you yeah. to answer it but that's kind of just the topic i guess okay well well thank you for the compliment um I guess a lot of it comes from growing up, um, always having to work for what we got. Um, and I don't, I don't mean that in a way of people that come from a privileged background can't be professionals. Um, but it, it started young for me. Um, we weren't poor, but we weren't rich. We worked, you know, when I started wanting to buy shoes or or designer Nikes or whatever have you, I had to get a paper route. I had to start working to get money. I had to, when I turned 16 in New York, I was able to work a part-time job. So I had to get a working permit and then try and find a job. And then, you know, then I started playing volleyball travel and I wasn't able to work as much because I was traveling and playing volleyball, but knowing the sacrifices my parents had to make then for me to pay my dues and to travel and all that stuff and play that. Um, going to college, I took out student loans. Um, I had a, a half scholarship, but um, going to a state school out of state, that didn't help very much. Um, but I think professionalism and your drive and your goals and your motivation behind it evolves and it has to evolve because you as a person evolve and um it's gone through many phases um in my career now it's pretty much just directed towards my family and and what that means what i have to do and how i have to perform and how that influences how i can provide for them in the immediate and in the future um so, but I mean, there was times when it was like, shoot, I want to buy nice cars. I want to buy a nice house. I want to rent a nice apartment in Southern California. I want to go to the nightclubs and not wait in line. I want to go to a nice dinner and order the steak and not have to worry about what it costs. And, and knowing that, how I had to arrive to that meant that Monday through Saturday, I got to train and work my ass off because it directly influences what I can do Saturday night and Sunday. And it was very short term goals when I first started, like I'm just living for the weekend. I, mean, I think <laughs> most people do in a way, but for volleyball players, especially national team players, those weekends don't come very often. So, I wanted to be able to do what I wanted to do for those few days that I got off in the year. Um, I mean, when I first joined the national team, the first five, six years, I was training anywhere from 48 to 50 weeks a year. Like, if you think about it, like two weeks off, that's pretty hard. Yeah. And it wasn't even two weeks off. It was, <laughs> I couldn't choose those two weeks. I didn't right. get to choose the time I could go on vacation for two weeks. I didn't get Saturday and Sunday off like most people who work nine to fives. Like I was training Monday through Saturday for a match on Sunday. Sometimes we got Monday off, but not always. You know, like all these things happen. You know, in, in this national team, our day off is our travel day back home. <laughs> like it's crazy. Yeah. But, um, Professionalism, it's it's different for everyone, not only because your profession is different, but your mindset is different. How you approach it has to be different because everyone is different. Um, what, I, what I view hard work as is somebody who doesn't complain when things get tough because somebody has it worse, somebody has it better, somebody has it worse, and somebody has to work 10 times harder than you just to get a glimpse of what you're doing 
and I forget that at times. I'm not saying I'm perfect in it because I still complain. And I, cause I think things can be more efficient. I think I can be better if the system was more efficient, but those complaints don't come from me just wanting it easier, just to have it easier. It's because I think as my career is coming towards an end, the time is few, fewer and far between those opportunities to compete for championships, medals, gold medals, money, contracts, everything. It's just, it's all coming to an end. And it's, it, I, I can't believe I'm sitting here now talking. I can't believe that I played for 15 years. Right? It's been so fast and quick, but it's not over. And I'm trying, I'm not trying to like hold on to the dream, you know, but I'm, I'm trying to embellish it and understand it and learn even more and, and put myself in a situation to achieve the goal that I want. And that's the gold medal in the Olympics. So that's, that's like in a nutshell, my professionalism and like how it has evolved and like where it's at now. It's, it's an invigorating conversation for me because it means that much to me. I think it's also like being around you, it's also like you do have a certain personality trait of that perfectionism and like oh, just sure. that way about, you know, like att approaching anything that others don't have. And that is every every character trait that we all have can be a blessing and a curse. Um, mm -hmm. And you've found a way to make it a blessing. So and my other question was, I know family is super important and overseas life is difficult for everyone um and you are in my mind one of the people that comes to mind when i think about mental health overseas and like being an ambassador of mental health in a way which is odd because you're not the not like everywhere on social media like other ambassadors for mental health are and like these quotes and these pictures but you but you just are because of your experiences um and the people that are around you know that can you touch on mental health overseas the journey that you went through um a little bit you don't have to dive into it a lot mm -hmm. but i know that that's something that we touch on on this podcast a lot is just the overseas life and how it can get difficult yeah so i think i touched on it earlier about like how you have to be a person first and then like an athlete on top of it and that's because we as individuals as humans are affected by so many different things throughout our day that when you arrive to the gym for training it's really hard to unpack all of that and leave it and then just compete you're here for three hours let's just work well you you can't control your thoughts and so like if something is really bothering you when you showed up to training and it's just constantly in your head like two things can happen. You can get hurt, you can hurt somebody else, or you're just, you're not gonna get enough out of that training. So like, you have to be able to show up to the gym, understanding that yes, there's all these extenuating circumstances that are happening in your life. And if you can figure out mechanisms to put them aside for a couple hours, knowing very well that as soon as training's over, you're gonna get back to them. Um, and you're not going to just like kind of pack it down and let it go. Um, it it frees you a little bit to 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 go task at hand. Now uh, I say that saying it's easy. It's not easy. I mean, I think again, if you follow my career, I I left Kazan during my third year, my fourth year, my fourth year. I don't know, no, my third year. Sorry, my third season. I left 2015. I was there for a month and I just said, I'm out and I just flew home. I was like very willing to just forget my contract, pay any penalties I had to and just be done. I was pretty much ready to retire from volleyball. Uh, the way that that professionalism that you, you brought up before and, and how it turned it into a blessing. At first it was a curse. It, it really hurt me. It really hurt me. And, anxious all the time, 
um, got to the court, was only thinking about going home, got home, was only thinking about how I just wasted three hours on the court and I wasn't getting better. I wasn't putting my team in a better place and feeling guilty about everything that I was doing professionally and socially. Um, I was just in a really bad place. And I don't know if there was necessarily signs externally to other people because, you know, I only got to see my family so many times a year. and It was always fun. And I guess we can all put on a good mask from time to time. And, um, I might be rambling here, but like mental health is just, mm. it's, it's very important, but it's very individualized. And part of the reason why I don't necessarily go out there and be like, Hey, everyone, it's mental health day. Like check in with your friends because some people don't need to hear that. Some people just do it. And some people can see that and be like, you know what, I should check in with my friends and they don't and they feel even worse about it. And I also just, I know it's a tough road and you can't do it until you're ready. And um, luckily my wife is really good with forcing me to talk about things. And she's very good at sensing when something's not good or I mean, it could be as simple as I, I don't know, I didn't wash the dishes last night and I'm pissed. I got to get up in the morning and do it, you know, like just anything. And, but being able to acknowledge that and not be ashamed of the way you feel, um, it's a big step because there's times where I, I, st I still feel ashamed about the way my emotions go and the way I feel. I and mean, I have a toddler, he's not even two years old. It's extremely frustrating, but I'm also his dad and the way he looks at me, like makes up for everything else. You know, like today we just sat on the couch for, he only napped for an hour, he usually naps for two. And he just like laid on my chest and we watched Paw Patrol for 40 minutes. Like it was incredible. Like uh, I'll never be able to replace those experiences and if I was frustrated because you only nap for an hour versus two, like I don't get to enjoy that moment with them instead of just being there with them. So like mental health can be across the board. It can be across the board for anyone. Sorry, that's kind of ramble. No, 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 no. We want to give you the floor and like those questions weren't specific. They were just, I just wanted to know where you're at and just hear your thoughts on it in, in general. And I know it was going to be, a little bit longer. I'm also sorry, I'm in the hotel and there's people in the lobby, it just echoes like crazy and they're just yelling in Polish, but I don't know how, how loud it is, but I apologize. You're good. No, you're cruising, but that's something like mental health. It's something that in college, like I played at Hawaii and it was pretty, I mean, it was pretty, anything you hear about the Hawaii life, we had it really, really good and we had, Best situ well, for me personally, best situation, all this other stuff, and just a lot of stuff handed to us and whatnot. But then I come over here, and that's something where it's like all of a sudden, uh, there's so much, like you said, there's so many things that can go wrong, or so many things like external stuff that goes on that just like on the volleyball court, off the volleyball court, whether it's like different coaching styles, like you said, or just it, all this, all this stuff. And um, sometimes, like I said, like mental health is definitely something that I've definitely taken a lot more serious since coming over here because it's like, it's, I mean, you spend a lot of time just by yourself and a lot of the time um, you just, it's like, there's not anyone else here. And like my friends are asleep and it's just like you for like three or four hours in the middle of the day, especially where mm -hmm. it's just like, Oh snap. Like I gotta, like the biggest thing that I remind myself is just remind yourself again, how, like you said, someone has it worse out there and mm -hmm. You know what? Sometimes I just gotta take a second and just like smile and be like, okay, just be happy with you are. Otherwise, you just get complaining a lot of the time, and and that just makes it worse. But like you said, that's not an easy thing to do, and I think that's something that I am learning to this day. Um, man, we appreciate you uh, speaking on that because that's that's a, that's a very heavy subject. Um, yeah, in all our lives. It's, it touched on something you said about like being alone in, in solitude. I'm I really like to be alone. I really like my alone time. Um, when things got really dark for me, that alone time actually was painful for me yeah. because 
I could just sit there in my thoughts and they were so negative. Uh, and I mean, the thoughts themselves weren't actually negative, but the way I was perceiving them was extremely negative. Um, but now I look forward to my moments of being alone for the fact that it's a check-in with myself. Um, and then I can, having that extreme experience, I'm able to use those moments of checking in to get a sense of where I am. Um, and, and so like if my family goes on vacation for a week or whatever, and I'm stuck here training, I got two days or whatever. I can look at it like that, like ugh, they're on vacation. I'm stuck here working, and, you know, shoot, they didn't do any of the laundry, they didn't do the dishes or there's no food in the fridge. Like, ugh, like, gosh, or I can be like, oh, I get to choose what I get to eat this week, you know, um, and I get to organize the house a little bit better the way that I like it versus the way that they like it. Um, there's, there's so many other ways that I can spin it, but just knowing that I'm having those negative thoughts and like, well, why am I actually feeling that way? Is it because that there's no food in the fridge and I'm tired and I don't want to go? Or do I miss them? And most of the time it's, it's like I miss them. I want them to be with me. I want to be around them. And I want to enjoy this experience together versus us being in two different parts. And um, so that solitude, that aloneness doesn't necessarily mean you have to feel alone. It's we always have a companion in ourselves and understanding our mental health, our thoughts and everything. They, they all stem from something. And if you can find ways to unpack it and address the underlying issues, you put yourself in a better situation than most. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a good distinction between being alone or in solitude and feeling lonely. I think they're like way two way different things. And you can be like this. I'm sure there's, there's those quotes that's like, you can be in a crowd and be lonely. It's a lot of people are lonely with a lot of friends around and a lot of people are not lonely and they live alone and yeah. live overseas. And there's a huge difference. So, for sure. well, again, thank you for hopping on. One more thing before before we let you go here. We asked the, our fans if they had any questions for you. So we're going to go through a few rapid-fire questions if you'd be so kind of to answer them. Um, first one, does he intend to go to Paris in 2024? And if so, why? Yeah, simple. I want to win a gold medal. 100%. Um, who's the best setter you played with? Oh, putting me on the spot here. That is a tough one, probably. Mike, come on. No. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't even thinking that. That's true. Uh, that is no, true. Um, oh, shoot, That's a man. tough one. Uh, yeah, Michael Christensen's pretty freaking good, man. He's pretty hard to beat. Okay. Um, if he had to make a best team ever but could only use past teammates, what would that be? <sighs> okay. Um Read pretty. I'm not including myself in this, so okay. uh, take myself out. Read pretty. Max Mikhailov. Um, Micah Christensen, setter. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I'll keep him as a setter, not a spiker. Um, Alexei Verbov is the libero. Um, David Lee, middle blocker. Um, you got one more outside and one more middle, I think. Yeah, I'm thinking. I hope I don't miss anybody. Um, probably Max Holt. And uh, man, I don't know. Another outside. There's too many. But Reed, Reed is just. When Reed was on, man, he was so dynamic and just killed it. Shoot. I would say Sergei Tatugin, but I didn't play with him. Um, we played against him a bunch. Okay, I'll put myself out there. I'll play with Reed. There's Leon, no? Yeah. No, I know. I, come on, man. I'm playing with him now. I, I got him. I got him. 
Um, all right, two more here. Will he ever change over to Beach like Taylor Sander? No. Okay. <laughs> do you do you like Beach at all or no? I yeah. What I mean, yeah, but um, I'm not. I have no aspirations to play. If <laughs> <laughs> anything, it's just to to joke around with my friends. That's true. All right, last one here. Biggest area, biggest area you still believe you can improve? Blocking. Easy. Okay. Well, I did always... get some of those stuff today in training, though, so I'm really stuck. <laughs> Is that is that something that you've been working on for a while, or is just kind of recent? Every day, man. Every day. <laughs> hey, well, well, Matt, thank you so much for hopping on the pod, man. Uh, we're we're very very oh. grateful to hear such a such a tenured volleyball player like yourself, and uh, we we stay we stay uh, humbled that you would join us on our podcast. Thank you so much, man. Well, thanks for having me, guys. Really appreciate it, Matt. Thank you so much. Give your best to you, your family. We apologize to your wife for holding you. <laughs> but uh, thank you. Have a wonderful night. And good luck. Thank you. You too. That was actually the first time I have actually spoken to Matt Anderson. So that was a privilege um, for him to hop on because, like I say, we always have these big name guests. But a lot of time, and I've said this a billion times, First time I ever talked to him. Have you have you had any contact with him at all, Joe? Before this? Yeah, I I after the 2019 season, um, after senior year at Hawaii, I went and worked out the national team all summer, and there was a lot of sessions. Uh, he was there. We were working together. Um, and he was nice. He came up and he said, "Oh, just congratulate on a great season and stuff." But nothing like this. This is the most extensive I've spoken to him. I've heard other interviews he's done. But it's crazy to think about a guy like that. He's literally on every single possible thing except an Olympic gold. Like, for his career, he's won everything. Yeah. Personal awards, team awards, everything besides the Olympic gold. So, it's the one. That's what's true. it called? It's the last. Accolade. Sixth, infinity, infinity Stone? Is that? There you go, Joe. Is that a thing? Look at you, man. What would that be? The power? I would, I, I'm not even going to go down that rabbit hole. That's a deep rabbit hole. I would break it down each stone finding which one those would be um but yeah just having a sort of mellow guy like a guy but also like super mellow him allowing to talk about like mental health and talk, and just really like drop his card yeah. and stuff like that that's not <laughs> i just met the guy you know <laughs> and then he was just willing to just talk about all that man so um uh but there's definitely some juicy facts each 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 time we bring on a guest especially because i meant like cause when we we're interviewing people in hawaii I found myself just asking questions. I'm like, oh, the fans probably want to hear this. I'm like, oh, it's interesting for me. But now, I do. I'm I'm just as interested, like if not more interested. I'm asking questions for myself a lot of the time. And I think that makes for a better conversation, and I think that just is more informative, you know. Um, but yeah, but okay. Anyways, guys, I want to give a special thanks to our big sponsor, Manscaped. For years, my goat, my as my dad said, my gonads would actually be beat up with the same razor that I would use year in and year out. I'm not going to name a brand or anything like that, but no brand competes with Manscaped and Lawnmower 4.0. And now i got them fresh, smooth as a baby's butt, okay? Think your holiday spread is good? It's time to give thanks to Manscaped Performance Package 4.0, or as I like to call it, the perfect package for your package. Inside, you'll find there a lawnmower 4.0 trimmer, weed whacker, ear and nose, hair trimmer, crop preserver, ball deodorant, crop reviver toner, performance boxer briefs, and a travel bag to hold your goodies. Think of it as a cornucopia for your balls. The lawnmower 4.0 trimmer features cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents thanks to their advanced skin safe technology. It also gives you ability to turn the 4,000 K. LED spotlight on and off, and when needed, for a more precise shape. Plus, it's waterproof. I mean, come on now, guys. We've talked about the last three pods. Joe, what are you repping right now? What are you repping right now? I'm repping the only shirt applicable for this moment true. in this podcast. And what do they, what do they got to use? Let's give them a little holiday special. Just because, I mean, not that our uh, that's not our podcast shop on Friday. Isn't a holiday special. If you're listening special. this far, I think they, they deserve a promo code. 
to get for you're their right. loved ones, for themselves, <laughs> whoever you're going to get this for. Bali Balls, all capital. Bali Balls promo code. Use that. And if and if this is the well, first of all, if this is the first time you heard about Manscaped and you're of age, you need to be looking into this if you're a male. And if you're a female and you're like, I don't know what to get my boyfriend, let me tell you something else. Whether it's your a mother out there listening, whether it's your sister, a brother, it doesn't matter. When your male friend needs a little trimming for his little mistletoe down there. Lawnmower 4.0. Again, promo code. Bolly balls, plural, all capital. Bolly balls, your promo code, 20% off, free worldwide shipping. Guys. It's also great for white elephant gifts. Oh, that's People true. People love it. It's great. White elephant, office party, man's Imagine you show with ball deodorant for an office party. White elephant gift. I'd be like, hell yeah. And we've used it, let me tell you. Although we live in a chaotic world over here, it gives me sweet, sweet comfort when I do use it. So it's a stability you need in your life that you didn't know. Guys, just remember. Well, first of all, Joe, thanks for hopping on the pod, brother. Hey, amen. And thanks to Matt. That was, that was a long time. He's Absolutely. a family and everything, and I know the guy's got to get going, so that's sweet. Absolutely, brother. Stuck hey. around to talk a little bit with us after, too, so you know, that's always appreciated. Sure. Just remember, if you can't handle the heat, Goddamn kitchen. This has been another episode presented by Out of System.